Hi. <laughs> I'm Alistair. Um, I suppose I should, just, I should just start? Yeah, do it. <laughs> cool. Uh, so I'm going to talk um, about the, the staking system in, in Polkadot. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about, um, the, you know, this, this talk is actually about election theory. Um, and how we go about selecting validators and what this means. Um, so, sort of, how do you design a, a proof of stake system? So, like, block, public blockchains are secure by economics, right? Um, so, I mean, you, we have a, a typically a consensus protocol that's going to make honesty assumptions. Uh, so, in, in Bitcoin, the original blockchain, um, if 51% of hash power is honest, then um, the system works. But actually, we don't want to assume that the miners are honest. Uh, we want to sort of, you need to argue that uh, if they're rational, if 51% of hash power is in the hands of rational miners, then the system works. And sort of in proof of stake, uh, it's, it's much the same, right? We want to design a system. Sort of the design goal is to um, build a system where if, uh, if a majority of the, the stake that's being used in staking is in the hands of uh, people who are rational, um, then the system works. It does require these participants to be active as well. Um, and rational and active are not necessarily the right sensible assumptions, so it's unclear if people really are rational, but if you give them big enough incentives, you make the default thing to do where possible, the right thing to do, um, educate people, you can probably get them to be approximately rational. Um, probably the, the harder one is um, who's going to be active. Like most users won't be um, running nodes themselves, like, I don't know about you, uh, I make transactions relatively rarely. Um, even the people that might own, you know, co companies that own, and individuals who own vast amounts of uh, tokens, they're probably going to put them in a cold wallet somewhere, and for security reasons, they're not going to make transactions very quickly either, or very often either, because they have to dig this thing out and deal with the threat of losing all their tokens. So... Um, we want to sort of design a system that is a sort of uh, still works even if um, people aren't that active, and the incentives have to be pretty blunt. So, um, how does Polkadot work? So, um, the key key part of the the consensus. Uh, so, Polkadot, as you know, has its relay chain, has a bunch of uh, other chains, parachains. And uh, a lot of the work securing these is going to be done by the, the validators. Like a set of uh, 100 to 1,000, we'd love to get 10,000, I don't know if it's easy, uh, nodes. And uh, like the relay chain itself, we, we have a consensus protocol that it's going to be secure if, uh, if, if two thirds of people are honest. Um, we also divide the same set of validators in between into sort of subsets, randomly rotating uh, between each of these parachains. And uh, this is a much smaller group of people, right? If we're going to have a thousand validators and a hundred parachains and we want a hundred parachains, then we're down to sort of 10 or 20 maybe validators per parachain. And um, we, we sort of but there's procedures to back that up. If, if the, the, all these few guys collude, then um, we're going to be able to report them and, um, and correct the situation. So, um, and the sort of question that I'm trying to address in this talk is, is how do we uh, select validators? Right, and what we want... Um, so we, the aim is sort of to be, we want to be decentralized, which means that users with a small amount of stake should be able to participate. And also, 
we want people to be involved in staking who are not actually running nodes. Um, and, and that's why we're going to have a, a sort of system where we basically elect validators using stake. So some people are going to be validators, but some other people are going to be nominators, and they're going to basically uh, tell us who they trust, and we're going to, um, and who they want to sort of back with their stake. And then we're going to um, select validators somehow. Now, so one critical thing about this, this, this parachain system. So we need, um, yeah, maybe I'll go back to that. So in order to, you know, so, so if I'm nominating someone and it turns out they're dishonest, then you really want to, to have a big incentive for people to switch, particularly if they're inactive. And one thing I think you really need to do, you really, we really need to have both uh, slashing and rewards. So if validators do the wrong thing, and we detect they're doing the wrong thing, and this is particularly the case for, for parachains. Like if we, we can't rely on these 10 people being not colluding and trying to attack the system, so we have to make it really expensive. And uh, that means that when we detect this, is gonna, this has happened, we need to um, slash these guys. And we're also going to slash the nominators to give them an incentive. And um, if we're going to slash nominators, then we've definitely got to be rewarding them too because for their risk, and ideally this would also correlate with uh, validated behavior. And so the rewards are going to have to be split with validators and nominators, and, you know, and the, basically the, the validator is going to decide. And yeah, so, so one, one crucial difference in between uh, Polkadot and some other systems um, is that because we only have 10 guys on, on a parachain, we want to make sure as much stake as possible is backing these guys. Basically, all validators are equal. You're not going to be participating in, in the consensus. You, you, you know, your vote is not going to be proportional to your stake for the validators because uh, then if we, we select 10 people, we kind of have very little stake backing them and the system isn't very secure. It doesn't cost very much to attack a parachain. So uh, the crucial thing is that basically all validators are going to be equal. So, um, so this talk is about how we elect validators. How do other people do it? I dare say um, people have heard of uh, DPoS, the scheme used in EOS, um, and other chains. And um, basically that what they do is they use approval voting. As a, a delegator, you vote for every candidate you trust, and we just um, pick the 100 or 21 or whatever guys with the, um, the most stake trusting them. And uh, yeah, this has some advantages. Sort of the way you would think of this is that it's um, even the 100th guy is trusted by a lot of people. But uh, the sort of downside, so, so the question is like, if we want to attack, say, the, the relay chain, we need a, a third of validators to be bad. How much stake do we need to do that? And it, it's not really very clear. It could be just one, one person with enough stake backing all of these because basically you have 100 votes. You can vote for as many people as you want and um, so when, when we slash these a third of validators, we're not slashing a unique stake. And so we're not at all sure that we're slashing a third of stake in the system. It depends on how things are organized. Um, and in theory, if you have enough, you can back all third bad guys with the same stake, and then you just lose this once. And kind of the, the real problem is um, and there's also issues with sort of getting into the validator set. Uh, like the core problem with approval voting is 
it's unrepresentative. So, you know, if we want a third of state backing a third of people, we don't get that here. Um, so you, you might say, like, if I have 5% of the stake, then maybe I should get 5% of the validators, but in, in depots, no. It's, you need to get a lot of people to, uh, behind it. And if you have 51% of the stake, you can get everyone. And in particular, this sort of doesn't play well with uh, slashing and trying to analyze that. So what else can we do? Another uh, election scheme is sort of one Cosmos doing, and they call bond a proof of stake. So, so now we have delegators, but we only delegate to one validator. So what that means is that when we slash a validator uh, and their stakers, then um, we slash many validators, and then we, then we slash their stakers as well. We're sort of guaranteed the stake is unique. And so now it's expensive to, uh, definitely expensive to, to slash 10 or a third. But, um, and the other thing that we, we're gonna do is because we're gonna have slashing of, uh, so in defaults, they don't slash, they don't slash delegates at all. In, in, in bond and proof of stake systems, you do. And um, this means that we have to lock stake. So we'd have a system where you'd lock stake for a month, and we're doing this too. Um, but the sort of, the, the, well, the first downside in sort of Cosmos's system, if you look at, th this was a snapshot I took of the, uh, the 100 Cosmos validators last year sometime, towards the end of last year sometime. And um, the main thing you notice here is, is the, the inequality of stake backing validators. Now, for Cosmos, for a single chain, it doesn't matter. We can have uh, stakers' votes proportional to their stake. Um, but for us, if we sort of have 10 people on a parachain and those are the, the bottom 10 people here, then we have, um, you know, um, it shouldn't, instead of a tenth of the stake, we have 0.5% or something. And that means it would be really, if we have this sort of system and this sort of distribution, it would be really um, cheap to attack a power chain. You just have to wait until uh, you, you, you have some two guys who with small backing and you wait until they're all on the chain and then um, you can do an attack. So um, we want something kind of like this, but we definitely need more equally staked validators. So more equal state backing on these validators. So the way you could, uh, like the simple economic way to do that, we, we just pay all validators equally. And what that, what that means obviously is that um, if I'm backing a validator with a lot of stake backing them, then I'm gonna get a smaller share for my uh, stake, I'm gonna get a lower interest rate. Um, so obviously there's an incentive to, with the same risk, so obviously there's an incentive to back validators equally. Um, and now, so now in the, the example where I have 5% of the stake and the sort of 100 validators, I would just uh, somehow split my stake up and uh, delegate to five different validators. And then, I'd, then they, they would definitely get in um, and I would get a much bigger, you know, I, I would get a 5% uh, of the return. Now, the problems are like, um, so one of the problems is that uh, because I'm backing one person, I now have a sort of a risk that if, I, if they don't get in, I don't get anything. And only the top 100 guys are gonna get in. And, um, and this is bad if I want my validators to be backed equally because I'm taking a risk going with the, the guy, uh, the 100th biggest guy, if, if he's pretty close to the 101st, right? Much better to go for uh, someone safer and get a, bigger, uh, get a, get a uh, slightly worse reward. Uh, unless, of course, we end up in a situation where we just, everyone's decided that these 100 are the, are the guys to go with, in which case it's fine, but there's a, there's a high barrier for entry. 
it's, uh, even if new guys are trusted, there's no easy way to get them elected because the people, the, the delegators, the nominators would need to coordinate. And this leads to a problem, right? So if we, we do have an attack, some validators are slashed, now we need 10 guys are slashed, now we need 10 guys to replace them. And these guys don't have much backing them, right? Because there was no incentive to back people who didn't get in. And um, well, that means if the bad guy's faster, and it's gonna take people a while to react, like nominators, if you know, you see this happen, you're gonna make a transaction when you next get round to it. Uh, maybe the bad guy's faster, like they already knew that they were gonna do the attack, and they've already got the next 10 people lined up, and they can get them in with a very small amount of stake stacking them, and then they can just do it again. And this time it's much cheaper, right? Um, and, like, and, and so sort of the, one of the problems here is that I don't expect nominators to be that active. Um, and they might not react fast uh, to changing conditions. So in this case, maybe someone's backed a lot less than others. They'll take a while before like, the economics makes it be even. And then when things change, it's going to be uh, the guys at the bottom are not going to be backed by very much if anyone drops out, and especially not if they're slashed. So what we really want to do is to have the protocol doing this adaption for us. So uh, the basic idea of nominated proof of stake is this. So, so our nominators, like in Depos, you're gonna be able to vote for multiple guys who you would trust with your stake. And then the protocol itself is going to decide um, which of these, uh, which validate you back with your stake because you, your stake sort of wants to uniquely back someone. Or maybe it's going to split your stake in between uh, multiple validators and sort of the aim is to, so we want the, these, these 10 guys on a power chain to be as well backed as possible. Sort of the optimization problem here is to, uh, the simplest way to do it and to get the third two is to um, make sure that all validators are well backed. So we want to maximize the um, the least back validator. And then we can make rewards and slashing uh, proportional to like where your stake is, is backing at any particular time that the bad things or good things happened. Uh, so I probably need a picture. So like these guys with dots on the left are nominators. Uh, they're using their dots to uh, nominate validators and these sort of lines represent how this is going to work. So um, some people are going to have their, their stake switch, their, 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 their sort of thing divided in between people they, they vote for with a sort of aim of making everyone back as, as equally as possible. Yes. Which one. Yeah. If you, you if you if you nominate one person, then it's 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 just them. But if you nominate more people, yes, you, the protocol decides. I don't know if it's about the protocol, but if you believe the protocol can do that, why you don't allow the protocol to decide for all the? Protocol? Right. So the point is, is that we need it's it's a trust relationship, right? We want uh, it's important. We want our validators to be honest. And to do that, we need to work out, we need to work out that someone trusts them. In fact, nom so nominators only vote for people they trust and their stake is on the line when they do it, right? If, this guy, if a guy I vote for misbehaves, my stake is on the line. So I'm in practice, probably I'm gonna nominate people I know personally. Or... Um, So you could only so you you so you only nominate people you vote for, right? So it's a question of how in between those, how do we divide it so that we, right. yeah. How will the protocol know what? Which is better than the others? It doesn't. It's just it's just we want uh, we know who people trust, right? Uh, and we assume that people who are trusted with this much stake um, are going to be. Uh, hopefully honest, and that you know, the nominators are definitely gonna do their research. 
so that, that we have to hope that nominators do research on who they should, who they should be backing and that they know that which of these guys are likely to attack the system and which of these guys have, you know, um, as a validator, if you're looking for people to nominate you, you probably have to be public about your security procedures, about who you are, where you're from, and hopefully this, uh, and, your, and your income is sort of dependent on getting people to nominate you. So the hope then is that they'll be honest. No, well, nominators vote that you, you just say, I have this much stake and I'm prepared to back these people. Yeah. And then it's up to the protocol to solve, to try and find a good enough solution to this problem. Now, um, so obviously election theory is a pretty old subject. And recently people have been trying to... Um, uh, so, so, we, so the property we've got here is actually kind of proportional representation property. But often what people who um, study election theory do is that they're kind of interested more in what I consider to be underrepresentation. So underrepresentation is like this guy who owns 5% of the votes and they nominate, uh, nominate enough people should get five guys in, five validators in. Um, you know, they're, they're concerned about minorities being represented. But actually, we kind of have a security problem. Uh, so, so this, this, this proportional justified representation is a, uh, an axiom that uh, people came up with relatively recently. Uh, I've got a reference on the next slide, I think. In, like, if, if I have a certain fraction of the state and I vote for enough people, or a group of people have a certain fraction of the stake and they vote for enough people in, in common, then they should have this amount of representation. And, but what we're, we're kind of interested in for security is, it's really, we're trying to prevent over-representation. We're trying to prevent a special interest group from getting a decent number of representatives who they can then use to attack the system because we want it to be as expensive as possible to attack the system. Um, and that's why we want sort of validators to be well backed. But this, and so we came up with it with this problem, um, had some goes at trying to solve it, and then of course we discovered that election theory is an old, old subject. We found some other papers on it, and then they found we discovered the work of this of a Swedish mathematician back in 1895 because you know, um, and. He actually came up with, a, with a, a, a problem which was sort of equivalent to this problem. And um, some of these guys looking at this property uh, recently, however, showed that this particular formulation was empty hard to compute. But he actually gave a heuristic that, um, like this recent paper, Brill et al., showed that was. Um, that satisfied this disproportional representation axiom they come up with earlier. And so this is actually what we're using in, in Kusama right now, this is sequential fragments method. Um, and it doesn't actually, um, it does have this proportional representation software. It's not amazing at the, the thing we actually want. Uh, we'd really like to solve this mp hard problem. So we tried to figure out, I, it, together with my colleague uh, Alfonso Cavallos, we tried to um, come up with a solution to this problem. And actually, it turns out that it's MP hard to even approximate. Um, right, so the objective here is the, the stake backing the least back validator. It turns out it's MP hard to get that even within a factor of 1.2. But of course, um, these MP hard things are generally. Uh, we're probably not going to get anything. Uh, and we actually give an, a, a, an algorithm which gets a factor of two approximation. Um, and probably in practice, it's going to do very much better. And they're efficient enough, but not quite efficient enough to go on chain. In fact, even this, this heuristic um, is getting a bit slow for Kusama. So what we're going to have to do is do it all off chain. 
so we've got this MPHI problem. We've got some algorithms that are good enough uh, with a pretty well-defined objective. We want to maximize this thing, and we'd like to satisfy this property, this proportional representation property. So we're going to have a sort of competition. Uh, like all our validators are going to be running this thing off-chain, and on-chain we're going to decide. Uh, we're going to compare our, our things and check our properties, and um, come up with a hopefully a hopefully there'll be a good solution, and we'll use this to set, select our set of validators, which hopefully means we have decent security. And uh, yeah, you can kind of in Kusama we've only got sequential fragment, but you can already see how it works. We have some operators who are running 32 nodes and sort of try and get people to back them all. And they're a lot closer to the minimum things than the people who uh, are trying to just one one node and put all their money behind it. And you can see people trying to make this work. And uh, so I can have kind of some kind of faith that this will actually work well in, in practice. Um, but it's, it's sort of interesting that your everyone, different chains come up with, with different um, protocols, but actually it's often justified. You, know, like you shouldn't necessarily be using the thing that the other guys are doing because they're probably solving a slightly different problem. They have slightly different assumptions. Um, and so for us, the, the key thing was uh, we decided we, want, we needed elections to be decentralized, unlike Ethereum, who think they can get uh, a million validators. And um, we also have this thing where everyone's equal. And that's basically decided by a consensus protocol, and that determines what sort of algorithm we need. But yeah, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Did I lose people? Uh, does do, does uh, this particular algorithm is it easier to can you verify it on chain or what? Yeah, do you that, do? that's the point. We have an on chain competition. We verify you got a good solution. Uh, and what is it? How how sure is that verification? Is the the, the I guess. The... Well, um, so it's a competition, right? It's an optimization problem. Uh, and if we can put, express it that way, then it's very easy to. Uh, figure out on chain. And yeah, I suspect actually that the algorithms we've come up with do a very good, uh, a very much better approximation than uh, the hardness result would imply. I might, but I don't, don't know that they're actually optimal. Yeah, so yeah, is there a similar mechanism? Absolutely, we, we, we decoordinated slashing. Um, for things like being offline, it should cost you nothing if you're offline alone. Even for things like equivocating in, in our Byzantine agreement protocol, it, you can do that accidentally if you run two nodes. It should cost you something so that your nominators want to switch to someone who, doesn't, who does the right thing. But it doesn't need to cost you a lot because if you're doing it alone, it doesn't affect the security. If a third of people do it, it's pretty bad. But the, so the, the, the key thing for security of parachains is if we, we get sort of a majority or two thirds of whatever the parachain validators vote for something, and this is only a few people, we want to make this as secure as possible. So that's, if that happens, if we have your, your five to 10 guys voting or something, that's 100% slashing. I have another question too. Yeah. So the, the nomination process, like what, like what algorithm or like how, how do nominators determine who exactly they should, is it just kind of like it, a heuristic? It's up to them, it's up to them. Like, well, the people are going to, you know, make tools saying what, what you would get if you, I mean, already the UE will tell you what you get if you back these validators and people should look at historical performance and, I, I, like and I, all that, I, I but still, like I, text, I feel right? that uh, I would, I, I'm, I'm nominating on Kusama people I trust personally. Um, 
I'm not knowing anyone I don't, haven't met before, um, and at least know something about what they might be doing. So it's kind of, if you're, if you're vulnerable to being slashed 100%, you really want to uh, have some faith that these guys who you're backing are, are real people who have something on the line. Right, because dominators have to stake their own wealth. Yeah, so I, I think the, the, go, just going for the people that give you the most profit by looking at the thing is, is we, don't want, we want people to be thinking about switching when they could get more profit, but we don't necessarily just want them to just select the five lowest guys and vote for those. That, that's, that's bad, because that could be anyone. Uh, we, we, so if you have enough money to back your own validators, then that's fine. You can be anonymous. But uh, if you're looking public backing, I'd hope that you're going to get out there and try and convince people of everything that could possibly, you're doing everything right. The, you know, uh, I, 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 placing your delegation on people you trust, uh, you, you know directly, um, uh, I can easily imagine some people doing that where, you know, that means if they screw up, you know, they're also my friend and now I'm mad at my friend and that makes it worse, right? Um, so I'm curious whether, any, whether anyone already has arrangements or whether you're doing any structure around, you know, I can play, there are validators that are, you know, that are KYC. There are validators where I know where they live. I could sign a contract with them that if they screw up in a particular way, then they owe me, you know, per, you know then I have a contract that I get accountability elsewhere. Or if it's shown that they're fraudulent, then I know they go to jail in that regime or something like that. Do you see that emerge or do you expect to, to it, make that it, emerge? It's possible. Um, I don't know. It kind of depends on the willingness. So, so there's definitely validated, professional validated companies that are, uh, offering things on the side, but generally they, they want anonymous people to be happy backing them. So while the validators are public, often the nominators are not. And that means that there probably isn't a contract anywhere. But yeah, I think we will, we will see some companies going for the contract, I don't know. And there's any validators in the audience who... Uh, just follow on his questions, I'm also curious, given your protocol control the balancing, I, I don't know the details, I'm just speculating. Yeah. Is it possible for people to play around with the nominator to game the system, to basically attack your election algorithm? Because your election was, everybody has to validate, uh, kind of verify or ID whatever to vote. But in this case, I can nominate uh, one nominator can see like a lot of validators, so some people could game the system, just cheat. Well, I don't know how, how do you game the system? So the point, the point is, is the entire protocol is to make it as expensive. The design goal is to make it as expensive as possible to get those 10 people. If we make the, the, the least back validator um, as high as possible, then that means 10 times that is, is a lower bound on the cost of getting those 10 guys in. You can't get around that. Like, if we solve this MB hard problem, it would, this would be the, the hardest possible thing to attack. Well, okay, okay. That's not quite true because, yeah, the, there's a, a trade off between the 10, making the 10 hard and making the third hard. And this um, making the. Uh, so, this we unique. So, it turns, if you consider the problem as um, we want to make it. Um, so we want to make it expensive as possible to get a set of validators. So in particular, if we take the, the minimum backing of a subset of validators scaled by its size, divided by its size, then it turns out that this algorithm actually does that. And, um, and that analysis works, you know, even without the, the splitting being justified on any grounds. Uh, splitting people's stake is the thing, people's votes is the thing which um, makes it expensive to elect, to, to get subsets of people who are bad in. So you can't really game the system because your stake is split. Um, all you can do is get more people in by backing less Mac people. Cool, let's move on to the next thing, I guess. So uh, we're going to do like a fireside chat. I don't know, Jack, maybe you had some questions, wanna moderate some stuff. 
but we also like have few enough people here that we can make it a little bit more of an intimate thing, I think, and actually take questions and discussion topics or whatever from the audience. Um, so I'm up for whatever. Uh, you'll have to like, excuse me for being slow and like slow-minded because I've been up since 3 a.m. and then terribly jet-lagged. Uh, so, uh, you know, apologize in advance, but hopefully it's still okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll let you kick off uh, questions, I guess. Sweet. So, yeah, maybe setting the stage a little bit more. The um, Fred CTO at Parity, Alistair is one of the lead researchers, or as he goes by on the Polkadot Council, uh, lead scientist or scientist at uh, Web3 Foundation. So Parity is the main development firm behind Polkadot. And then Web3 Foundation at its core is, is, is community and really research. Uh, there's a lot of researchers at Web3 Foundation. And so there's a interplay between the two companies in, in building Polkadot, right? So um, I guess from, from your guys' perspective, how, how is, like where are we, how are things going? Um, with uh, rolling out Polkadot. I mean, it's been like two, two, two and a half years almost, and there's obviously been a growth of, of parity in the meantime and of Web3 Foundation in the meantime uh, from you know, the, the research side as well as the development side. How, you know, how are things going? Where, where are we at? Uh, very good question. I mean, the, a ton of stuff has happened in the past two years. <laughs> I mean, me being a parody, like I'm very focused on the execution side of it, not so much on the protocol si side or like protocol design side. So I'll let Al speak about how the protocol has developed maybe. Um, but on just the development side, you know, it's been a long journey from like we, we set out to build Polkadot, the, like the, just the protocol, the client, um, discovered along the way that it actually makes sense to build a blockchain framework first and then build that on top so that that's what Substrate became. Substrate in some way has been like a detour from just building Polkadot, but it's also something that, that now like allows parachains to be built super easily and like it, it sort of strengthens the whole community and, uh, and makes a bunch of other things really easy. Um, but I mean, just to sort of where, where we are now, we're super close to launch. We're kind of mostly waiting on audits to finish. And uh, you know, there, there's a lot of just practical, menial stuff to go through before a launch. And that's mostly where we are. There's no unsolved problems remaining. Um, there's nothing really even that is like fundamentally you know, unimplemented. Like everything is basically there. Um, for launch, so yeah, feeling pretty good about current state. What do you think, Al? Oh, I'm still got a mic on. Okay, that makes it simpler. Yeah. Um, so, um, Polkadot's are kind of developer-led in in many ways. Uh, so my, my job is to make it work in theory as well as practice. Uh, the sort of core ideas were set out in the white paper more than two years ago, and um, on the research side, we've been trying to uh, design a few things to sort of back up this vision. And we've got something. Now, a, a model of the entire system, how it's going to work, and uh, all the pieces are, are, are there. They're not all implemented yet, even though it's going to launch. It will be a slow launch process, I dare say. Um, so we'll start off with something very strip back, and then we'll slowly add features, um, although we still might be getting them relatively soon compared to others. And um, it will actually be a while before we, we scale up to 100 parachains and actually secure. Um, but we have a vision to get there. What do you, what do you think the, um, what does that, you've described it to me before in terms of like, the, the bits that you see as core being implemented and, by, and when. So kind of uh, walk, us through, walk us through that a little bit, unpack what you just said. You're asking me, not Fred. Yeah, um, yeah so when Polkadot launches, it's going to be, it, it's going to, well, like, like Kusama and like, um, it's going to be proof of authority to start with. Um, and then we're going to wait until we have enough people and then we're going to switch this proof of stake. Um, we even start with it with it with a sudo key, 
not even where, where one person can just Gav can just go and say we're going to change it to this, but then at some point we're going to disable that and like like Cosmos did, we're going to have token transfers disabled originally, but once we once we're fully decentralized, they'll be enabled, and then we it's a yeah, we have on-chain governance. It's all we we sort of upgrade this thing organically, and we're going to run everything on Kusama first. We go to um, and maybe other test nets. Parachains shouldn't be too far off. Like uh, Rob told me June today. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say that publicly so it happens. Um, and uh, but they'll be a while before they're on Polkadot, and then when, when they are on Polkadot, it will be a bit slow. We'll, we'll slowly scale up the number. Uh, we might hit networking constraints, and uh, we've got plans for that, which will come in later as well. Um, but uh, and, and while we do that, we're going to be you know implementing the security schemes, uh, like the data availability. If anyone is at Vitalik's talk, they'll realize how important that is, and. Um, the fisherman and the general uh, checking validity scheme, and those might those need parachains need to come first, and then those will be in. And I don't know; it might be a while before we have a hundred parachains and they're secure. What do you think, Fred? About the the question in general, or about parachains? Either. <laughs> um, no, I, I think Al describes it well. It'll be a staged rollout. Um, you know, this is pretty natural, I think. I mean, you, you start small, you prove that whatever you launch works, that it works the way you are intending it to work, and then you add complexity over time, sort of building this thing up uh, and testing one bit at a time. Uh, so you're not just like launching a super complicated, complex beast out there and saying, well, no one has any clue about how any of this works, but here it is. Um, so I think doing it staged like this makes it comprehensible, testable, safe in some way, right? So that's sort of the goal. Um, to the point of parachains as well, that's the goal there to start with super simple parachains that maybe to some degree remove functionality from the relay chain and make that a parachain, what we call sort of a utility parachain. Start with that, see that that works. Like you're not really changing the logic. You're not changing what the, the system as a whole can do, but you're testing the new architecture of it and while like remaining functionality so that again, it's safe. It's sort of, you can check for soundness along the way. And then yeah, you start adding uh, like real parachains built by the community. Um, and there, like, how fast we can scale that up really just mostly depends on networking and what. There's, like, one particular networking problem on sort of how you gossip blocks between validators because you can't, like, every parachain can't send every block to every validator. It becomes too much traffic. So you need to find some way to do this in a more directed way. Um, like. The Ethereum community is probably going to use Gossip Sub or something like that for this, and we might use the same, but it has some problems with that as well. So this is like an active area of research, um, and but that's like a problem that needs to be solved to get to like the hundred parachains. We can do quite a lot before then. Any ideas on on that? The the bit of that's still in research. Fred was mentioning. Well, it's not just research. People are implementing things, but um, we, we have a plan. Like with everything else, uh, we. But the networking is. I, I'm a theorist. I don't know. I don't understand networking. Um, I, I know enough to know that it's going to be a problem. Um, but it, it all. We 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 we're we're really going to have to implement it and see. Um, and we might not get it right first time. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not rocket science, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, the fundamental problem that you're dealing with is maintaining decentralization while reducing the amount of traffic. If we could say, you know, here's a backbone connection, all validators, please just connect to this, then the problem is solved. Like all tra traffic just goes through this and it's one-to-one -one complete direction, it, all is fine. 
but then we're relying on this one centralized backbone connection. Uh, and we don't want to do that, right? So how do you maintain full peer-to-peer -peer protocol while still saying like, I want to send this block to a set of validators that's responsible for this parachain? So it's, um, yeah, it's in, like Al said, and it's an active area of research and implementation mixed. And we have some good ideas and like there are many stepping stones to get us closer to it, but um, there's no like w holy grail here that like we have to find to be able to do anything. I mean, yeah, so, so the complication that we, we have, for a start we need 100 separate networks and then we need the validators to be able to connect to them because they're supposed to rotate. And then we in research made this thing a lot complicated because for data availability, we kind of have an idea of the right solution. It's erasure coding, like Vitalik talked about today. Uh, but that means now our 10 validators have to send different pieces to each of these 1,000 validators. Uh, you know, they all want their erasure coded pieces, but it's different to everyone. You can't gossip at all, or you're gossiping uh, more than all the data in the system because you have to add some redundancy. So uh, we need sort of validators to directly talk to everyone, which is not so, which is gonna require a fundamental rethinking of our, of our architecture a bit. Um, and we need sort of direct connections for collators to validators. We ideally wouldn't, gossip, wouldn't need to gossip. Um, the, the big things we need to them, the big proof of validity blocks. So there's gonna be some networking challenges. Fred, you mentioned the uh, detour to substrate a little bit. Um, any, in, anything, um, the, how that worked in, in history or anything you want to talk about around, around that, but also it's like developers entering the system. There's been, Polkadot isn't a smart contract chain. A lot of people sometimes can, um, think it is, but there's really in Polkadot, and something that excites me about it is there's a, a seems like a bigger design space in the sense that, um, I guess like Cosmos as well, you have the choice to build a runtime, you have a choice to build a blockchain, or you have the choice to build on a blockchain. And we haven't really seen people build on multiple blockchain, multiple parachain shards at once yet and see how that, that works in actuality. So just maybe sticking to the, the first two and because those are actually the programming language as well. Um, Parity's not just working on Polkadot the runtime as well as the Polkadot runtime environment, but it, the, your guys are also considering parachains. You're also considering how people build on the parachains. Inc, for example, I, a lot of smart contract uh, parachains are, uh, that's an upstream dependency for them. They're kind of relying on that to build, like Edgeware's relying on it. Um, there's a, 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 another t a couple teams building uh, parachain smart contracts, smart contract parachains relying on that. Um, and that's an entry point for developers into the Polkadot ecosystem as well. How do you see kind of like the cadence of those being um, mature for more developers to enter the space? And like, how, yeah, how do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, Substrate has been a fantastic journey. Like, I, we didn't set out to build this really, but as we, you know, started building it, we realized this is something that's crucial and this is needed in the space. I'm, you know, thrilled to see basically something on the order of 60 teams building on Substrate now, building parachains, building whatever, uh, building tooling. So yes, Parity is doing a ton of stuff. Like we're, we're building our own parachains as well for things that we consider sort of core infrastructure or necessary features of Polkadot in the future. Um, but also like tooling, we're building validator tooling, deployment tooling, governance, um, nomination tooling, archive nodes, you name it, There's wallets, signers, a uh, bunch of stuff. And um, uh, this is, you know, the, the only reason we're doing this is to help the ecosystem grow, to help developers be able to come into the space and have a good starting place to start working on it. Um, and. I mean, it seems like it's working. Like I said, there's about 60 teams building on Substrate. That's amazing. That's, you know, <laughs> like I, I was not super early in Ethereum, but I joined the space, I guess, 2016-ish. And uh, 
16, 17, I don't know, whatever. And like, I would be very hard pressed to name 60 teams building on Ethereum back then. Uh, I'm sure it existed, but it's like, it, it's cool like to have that even before Polkadot is launched. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it's, it's a testament as well to the fact that it is you know, somewhat stable. People can build on it. Uh, so the, to the point of stability, I mean, 2.0 is around the corner. That's another point of stability. Like 1.0 was a point of stability. 2.0 will be one. Um, there will be a 3.0 um, at some point um, n in less distance than there was between 1.0 and 2.0. <laughs> uh, I mean, that that's something that people have been complaining about. It's like it went too long from 1.0 to 2.0 and that the, the path to upgrade from one to two would be too difficult because there were so many changes going in. Uh, 3.0 will be like an easier thing to upgrade to and we'll also like explicitly put in some more effort to make that upgrade path easier and maybe even like to some degree scriptable. Um, but yeah, it's stabilizing. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's, it's in a very good place. What are the pieces of substrate that you think uh, that you're excited about. I, I mean, there's so many different things that I learn about all the time um, that teams could leverage to build kind of new applications or new um, uh, all sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, some uh, a thing that people typically don't realize is how flexible Substrate is, um, and what like the the amount of freedom you actually have in in writing your chain. So. Especially people that come from Cosmos SDK world where it's, it's pretty constrained what the API looks like and what you're building for. Um, in Substrate, like you remove a ton of bounds and um, y yeah, you get a lot of design freedom. So I think that that in itself is a cool thing. But then there's obviously a bunch of stuff that I think is exciting like off-chain workers is a thing that every chain, like almost all applications want at some point. Um, you know, it, it, it gives you a super easy way to do oracles and a bunch of other like primitives that, that we know that we need these days. Um, so sort of thinking and like taking a lot of lessons from Ethereum days, from other, from other chains, from, from other things and just saying, you know, we can build this in, we can provide first class support for this, this concept. Um, be that like pluggable consensus algorithms, be it, you know, custom database formats, be it off-chain workers, whatever that may be. Like there's a ton of stuff that we've learned from, from working in this space for five years that we're baking into this and basically saying, yeah, eventually everyone kind of needs this thing. So we're just baking it in. The, you, you also mentioned, and I can, both of you guys are free to answer this. Um, the utility parachains, right? Rather than the, and you, you compare that to the um, community-led parachains. Seller made an announcement today that they're gonna be potentially doing a parachain for like state channels. Um, there's been a number of other, like you said, 60 teams, a lot of those are building chains and deploying them to as, as Polkadot parachains. What are the bits, um, like what are the cadence? What's Polkadot MVP if you include the parachains for you guys? Is it an Oracle chain, a smart contract chain? like? Um, and and how, how do you see um, those, those being developed? A utility chain, as I refer to it, goes uh, kind of lower level than that, actually. So the relay chain will have things like auctions for parachains, right? But that doesn't necessarily need to live on the relay chain. That could be a, like have an auction chain that deals with the auctions. That could be a parachain in itself. So that's you know, an example of a utility chain. But then when we're talking about like there's, you could also call like file storage a utility chain because it, it provides that utility to the rest of the Polkadot network. So that if there's a file storage parachain, then all chains now have access to file storage. Um, Lots of parachains will provide you to, utility yeah, services to the, the rest of the system. Uh, and there is going to be a distinction in between parachains which win auctions and maybe parachains that governance just decides you get to be a parachain because uh, it's doing something crucial to Polkadot. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been doing some work on, on bridges. Uh, we're sort of trying to get teams to build bridges by the time we get the launch, that's pretty critical. Um, 
if we, if we really care about interoperability, we should try and interoperate with everyone that we can. And yeah, the, the uh, high leverage parachains, right? You mentioned you made a distinction between the parachains that provide a utility to do a lot of the rest of the system and then those that potentially maybe um, what, I guess, take, uh, take services from the rest of the system, maybe like a DAO or something like this, maybe, yeah, can you unpack that a little bit? Because in... Well, yeah, yeah I think that... Um, so there will be parachains which, which uh, more directly uh, have users, and those which basically um, their users are on other parachains, and so they're giving services. But I'm not sure there's a distinction, because, you know, all these things will be providing services to Polkadot. Yeah, I, I think we could classify parachains in three categories. One is like protocol, like they're part of the protocol <laughs> and, and Polkadot can function without them. That, that's like the, the very basic lowest level of utility chain. Then there's like a utility chain that, that doesn't really have a user like ASA. The user is another parachain. I think file storage is a good example. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, I want to store a file. Like that, that's not a thing that a user does. Like they're trying to do something else when they're storing a file. They're trying to save a document or whatever that may be. And like it, it's just a, a, the raw concept of like I'm trying to store some bits somewhere doesn't, that's not a thing that a user does. Um, but it's a thing that other applications do. And so that's like the third level of, of parachains is more user-facing things, applications, or it's smart contract chains that in turn host applications. What's the benefit of offloading some of that logic to the first order kind of uh, uh, utility chain? Why would we want to move auctions, for example, to a pair chain? Because we want to keep, keep things simple. Like the system is already complex enough as it is, and uh, the simpler we can keep the relay chain, the better. Just from a complexity management point of view, from an efficiency point of view, from an auditability point of view, from an upgrading point of view, like you can upgrade the auctions separately from other logic of the chain. Um, so I think there's just a host of nice properties with offloading some of this. Yeah, I mean, if we have less on the relay chain, we'll be able to spend more uh, the relay chain's own bandwidth to helping doing power chains. Uh, doing things we need to make power chains work, and therefore more power chains. Yeah, Fabi, what's up? So there needs to be some communication, like the, 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 the relay chain definitely needs to know who the validator set is. And if that election's being done on another chain, then um, that needs to be on the relay chain. And there's going to be security implementation, uh, security implications of, of this move. It's going to be, um, which is why I, I'm kind of surprised you think it's going to be the first thing. I would have thought that uh, it was one of the later things because we want to make sure that the system is actually secure uh, well, the, the, by the time I, we get there. I would say that yeah, the, the first things yeah. that get this are not the security relevant stuff, right? So um, like you say, like, being able to track the validator set changes. If you, if, like, you run into security problems when if you move that off to a parent chain, then how do you know what the finality is, right? Because like the, the relay chain determines finality, but if the parent chain determines the validator set, so then there's like a... No, that's, that's not know. so hard. If we, we, we need message passing, as long as it can tell the relay chain who's going on, as long as it's executing correctly. But we definitely need security because if you can compromise that, then you've just broken the system. Yeah. So like that, that gets into tricky territory. <laughs> but there's other, there's stuff that like, I don't think auctions, for instance, suffer this problem. Yeah, they're, 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 they're less serious. But yeah. one of the things that you really wanted to move off the elections, that's... Elections. That's, big. Yeah. That, that, that's, 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 that's a security problem, yeah. obviously. Um, but, but in theory, yeah, we can move almost everything. The, um, 
um, Alistair, you were talking today, or today in your talk about um, the, the fact that you know your, your validator, right? You're, you're not running your own validator, you're nominating somebody else, and you know them personally. And that, that's kind of a difference then, and you do that, it sounds like, because nominators get slashed in NPOS and, and Polkadot system. Whereas with um, like Tezos' system or something like this, there are, there you, there's no, nothing at risk for a baker or for a nominator. Um, uh, could you maybe get into a couple of, of differences around that or differences with, with other systems from a staking perspective like you were giving in your, in your talk today that, that might be worthwhile? Right, I tried to explain some of the differences in the talk. Um, so yes, unlike, unlike in Depos or unlike in Tezos, um, our nominators are going to be, uh, unlike, unlike in Cosmos, our, our nominators are going to be responsible, are going to be held accountable for what the people they, they vote for do. And as a result, yeah, you probably want to... Uh, Check, think very hard about who you're, who you're going to nominate. What are the pros and, like, what are the pros and, yeah, pros and cons of that, I guess, in terms of participation, et cetera? Well, yeah, it's probably not going to work for everyone, but we're going to have, um, I'm sure that validators are going to, we, we're going to have many people, many websites comparing validators, and validators themselves are going to uh, compete on um, what they can put out there uh, to convince people that they're good. Um, and the sort of hope is, is that the validators have money, have income on the line, and a reputation. Um, then they're going to um, not try and do something, not try and attack the system, and they are going to compete on being secure. And that, that's what we hope happens. Although it's the engineering's a bit a bit tricky. Um, who knows how the market is going to work. Yeah. Uh, many validators validate different networks and already have reputation. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, it's unrealistic, obviously, to expect that everyone uh, just nominates someone they know, right? I mean, the, there's, in an ideal world, this is a community of hundreds of millions of people. Like, hundreds of millions of people are not going to know the thousand that managed to get in, like personally, <laughs> um, so it's a it's a it's a um, tooling problem, in my opinion. Where like we're trying to build some tooling around this, uh, just for on a very simple level, so that something exists by the time you know Polkadot is is launching into POS, um, but it's kind of simplistic and, and probably not good enough. But like I've been talking to, to Will who like talks a lot to validators, leads a lot of the, the validator efforts. And um, you know, you could speculate about having a system that allows uh, the validators to connect to you know, a separate set of telemetry servers to prove their uptime, to prove their whatever they're, they're set up to, to get auditors to come to their server farm and check out their gear and actually certify them on something. Um, there, there's tons of security certifications people can get already, like you know, random like ISO 9000 cert cert certificate qualifications for blah, blah, blah. Like all, all of this exists. Um, like all of this security certification and, and like process certification exists for payment providers. They have to go through a ton of this stuff. Um, and you could apply the same thing to validators and just like actually have them prove their certificates and then record this somewhere, have them list that somewhere and say, I trust this validator because they've gone through all of this effort and like, you know, <laughs> they, they've gone through the same security procedures that Amazon has to be able to be a, a payment provider. Like, is that good enough to trust them? I mean, they could do that and still be malicious, but it's less likely at least. So there's, you know, to Al's point, I don't know what, like, no one knows what the markets will actually look like, what the behaviors will actually look like. Um, but I think it's a tooling problem and we just need to be quick in adapting to the situation as it evolves. Yeah, there are definitely risks from the market side. I and mean, so two big ones are we end up being centralized. It's such a hard thing to do that uh, only a few people do it and everyone backs them. And then we have a single point of failure. 
the other risk is that it be, it's basically unprofitable and uh, or it becomes unprofitable that that's even worse we have lots of valid validators making money and then suddenly it becomes unprofitable and now they may be are all going to leave the system and if they're all going to leave the system then uh, they now have no, no, no incentive to um, not break it on the way out except for whatever reputation they have on other systems. Right, because, but you could decrease the validator set, but then the number of parachains at a certain point you would be able to have would be at risk. That's, that doesn't really, well, people leaving probably just leads to centralization, not less validators. Uh, all right. Well, does anyone have any questions? I can bring around the mic and finish up. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> does the parachain validators as, are the same validators for relay chain? Yes. The, yes. We, we take the, the set of, this one set of validators, they, of simply a thousand validators, uh, they all validate the relay chain. But we, we also divide this into 100 subsets for our 100 parachains. Okay. 10 validators each of whom, and, and these rotate. So the parachain validators are only temporarily associated with this particular parachain. Uh, but they're always relay chain validators. So if there are a lot of, uh, many parachains, the validators need to validate, the relay chain validators need to validate each transaction from each parachain. Right, so each validator at any one time is only a parachain validator of one parachain. So they validate transactions on that parachain. And oh. maybe they're going to be checking afterwards some other chain. Um, but it's going to be a constant number of chains that they're checking because we're scalable. All right. So they won't check every parachain? No. Uh, we don't expect, it, if, if we really succeed in scaling, mm -hmm. it, there won't be many people checking every parachain. But what? A single person will check every parachain. But so, every yeah. parachain will be checked. Yes. So what if the, well, uh, the validators for a single parachain, they are colluded? Right, so if they collude, they can get in a, an invalid block. Um, but at this point, we have... Um, a backup protocol. So it, we, we, can have, we can have challenges. We have fishermen that would go and say that this block is invalid. And we're also going to be having validators themselves check, randomly check other blocks. Um, and what that means is that, so I only have sort of one percent, if N, N pods is working properly, um, we, we're going to have over 100 power chain, it's going to be sort of 1% of our state behind this one. If those guys all collude, they can get an invalid block, yes, but um, if we can detect it with a probability 99% and slash them, we, so, we, so we, 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 can, we, can detect, we can detect it and slash them with probability 99% before it happens, before, before we finalize this block, then we can revert it and we have an attack which only happens 1% of the time but is slashed 100% of the time of the 1% stake, so the expectation of the cost of the system is all the stake in the system. That's sort of what we're going for. And that means we need to have a very complicated system of um, checking after the fact of um, people like fishermen complaining about extra validators checking more. If, if fishermen say that this thing is um, incorrect, they can put their own stake behind it and this will cause more, more extra validators to randomly check the block. And as soon as any validators, as soon as validators disagree, then we, we escalate to everyone in the system. So we, we can't do this for every block because it, obviously it breaks our scaling completely, but as soon as a validator has a lot of stake on the line, now it's fine for everyone to check it and then we can go with the majority. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Cool. Ah, sure. So would it be possible to connect uh, other relay chains to the main relay chain I guess as a way to scale. We have a plan for that, yeah. It, uh, the idea is nested or hierarchical relay chains. But it's, from a research thing, um, so I, um, Gabby's very bullish about this because, um, so, so Polkadot itself was built on substrate, which was 
designed as for, some, for a system for people to build on, and then they can convert their thing into a parachain. So we could very easily put the relay chain logic on a parachain. <laughs> um, but actually securing it is, has, is an interesting research problem that I don't think we've really got a solution for yet, but yes, we're definitely planning to do it. I guess you could summarize the security problem as for each level of hierarchy, the security is reduced. Right, yeah, so, so, so naively, um, what, the, what the relay chain, so, so, we, so we, we secure, we, we have this, this power chain that's also a relay chain, and the main relay chain sort of guarantees that its blocks are correct, but how much stake is, about the, is, is, is down behind these power, power chains? Now it's only the guys on this power chain, because the validators of the main system don't check the power, power chains, only the, only the probably the collators of this sort of uh, parachain. Is, is there a way to, like any theories in the works, how to, how to make the security? So I mean, when, when it comes to challenges, we can probably escalate them to the top when there's enough stake behind them, but um, things like data availability we, are kind of hopeless. And, um, and it, it's tricky. I mean, we do get, even if we rely on the top level of security, we, we get some scaling in terms of who has what data. Um, um, it may be that, that nested relay chains are worth it from that perspective, but we have to like special case them and, and put the security of the entire system behind them. Well, I think that can, that can be it. Thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks for uh, giving the, the talk, Alistair, and the fireside chat, Fred. Cool. Thank you very much. Let's get some beers. I think I see beers over there. Uh, there oh. <laughs> I should